Good afternoon and welcome everyone. I'm just gonna give a few seconds to let everyone sort of filter into the room and we'll get started in just about 30 seconds. Okay, hopefully that's given enough time for, for people to get logged on, but I will um, just start with a few opening remarks uh, today. Uh, I wanna thank everyone for joining us at this session. Uh, this is the transition between inclusive post-secondary education and decent work and the role of mentorship. Uh, my name is Morgan Ineson. I'm gonna be moderating the session today. Uh, I am the manager of education at Fighting Blindness Canada. And uh, just a quick description of myself. I am a 39 year old curvaceous white woman. I have blonde hair, blue glasses, and I'm wearing a very festive green and red plaid dress today. Uh, I identify with she, her pronouns. Uh, I'd like to begin today by acknowledging the indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. Uh, here in Toronto, I am on the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the Credit. From coast to coast to coast, we want to acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Meti, and First Nations people that called this land home. Uh, when I found out that we would be here presenting at this conference with the team from Evianse, I was very excited to learn more about their organization and the important work that they are doing to identify and challenge barriers to inclusive education. Uh, it has a lot of parallels with the work that we're doing uh, in mentorship at FBC, and I'm really looking forward uh, to our discussion today. So just to give a quick uh, rundown of how this session is going to go, we are first going to have a presentation by the team of Aviance about their research sustainable development goals literature review. Uh, today, Aviance will be represented by Evan Wickland, who is a Manitoba office lead and senior research officer for Aviance. Olivia Boonstra, who is a Senior Research Officer and Knowledge Mobilization Coordinator from Evianse, and uh, Tammy Bernaski, who is an Assistant Professor at Cape Breton University. So after their presentation, I'm going to hop back on and I'll be joined by uh, Mary-Kate Fraser. Mary-Kate is a Project Manager at a Toronto Hospital and is, has participated as a mentee in our mentorship program. And we are going to talk about the power of mentorship. So after uh, both of the talks, we'll have a live Q&A session. Um, and then at, after the Q&A, we'll have some closing remarks from uh, DWC steering committee member, Alec Farquhar. So uh, we will have this live Q&A at the end. You can ask your questions then, or if while we're talking at any time in the presentation, you have um, questions you want to share, you can go ahead and type those into either the Q&A box or the chat on your Zoom window. And uh, we will try to answer as many questions as we can at the end. Um, during the Q&A session, you can also uh, raise your hand and we can uh, unmute you as well. So we'll cover that again at the time. Uh, okay, so I think that's it for me and uh, for now anyway, and uh, I'm gonna turn it over to the team from Evianse for their presentation now. Okay, welcome to everyone watching and in attendance. My name is Evan Wickland. I am presenting today with Dr. Tammy Bernaski and Olivia Boonstra. Contributors to this project also include Mylika uh, Jigel and Sibel Sack. Today, we will be speaking about a partnership project called Sustainable Development Goals, a literature review, exploring the transition between inclusive post-secondary education and decent work. First, just a little bit about this project to get us started. In 2022, Evianse undertook this literature review uh, for this overall project. Um, this was a collaborative effort, uh, co-led by St. Francis Xavier University and uh, Toronto Metropolitan University and OCAD University. So there are five overarching areas that we will briefly touch upon today. First, we will look, we will provide information about the overall themes and demographics, and then we will look at what the literature had to say about positive and negative experiences that people with disabilities have in inclusive post-secondary education and decent work. 
In particular, we've emphasized on the transition between inclusive post-secondary and experiences of employment. Okay, now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Tammy Bernaski to talk a little bit about inclusive post-secondary education. Thank you, Evan. So in our review, we looked at the kinds of barriers that uh, students with disabilities face when trying to access uh, post-secondary education. The review found a number of themes and, and uh, issues related to barriers. There were social, attitudinal, environmental, technical barriers that can lead to lower completion rates for students with disabilities. So while there are more students with disabilities accessing education, because of these barriers, there are fewer students actually completing university and higher education studies. In terms of accommodations, accommodations ranged from the, the accommodations required in the classroom, of course, so things like extra time on exams, uh, stuff like that, but also accommodations around co-op placement, uh, lab work, field work, and work placements. There are complex structures in place that are really driven by the medical model that Evan just mentioned in terms of uh, requiring medical documentation to uh, seek for, for students seeking accommodations. And so that medical model really drives the accommodation process. In terms of seeking support, students with disabilities were reluctant to seek support for a number of reasons. Many of them are overwhelmed by that complex process I just mentioned. Others are worried about the perception uh, that faculty, staff, and other students might have if they find out that the student has an accommodation. There are issues around misconceptions that students with disabilities who have accommodations are at an advantage or have undue advantages because of those accommodations. They also sometimes spoke about wanting to do it on their own. So they want to be able to go through university and not have to rely upon accommodations to do that. There are misconceptions among students with disabilities, uh, students without disabilities, faculty and staff. So those misconceptions are really quite problematic in terms of the assumption that students with disabilities who have accommodations are um, getting uh, accommodations that put them at an advantage over other students. Also, there are barriers around uh, accessing funding. So there's a lot of gatekeeping that happens when students try to access additional funding. So sometimes students may require more time to finish their degrees, so they need more uh, accommodations and more time to finish those degrees, but they also need more funding. And so if there's gatekeeping in place, that means that there's also that medical process is, is in place for students trying to seek those uh, funding opportunities. One of the barriers that also exists for students with disabilities that also very much underrepresented in the literature is the issue of violence. So students with disabilities are disproportionately impacted by trauma and violence in post-secondary education, but the research in this area is currently limited. So in terms of creating a, an inclusive post-secondary education experience, we saw with COVID-19 that many of the online learning experiences, well, many of the learning experiences shifted to online. And so we know that there are barriers for many students when it comes to technology. Some students may not have access to it or they can't afford it, uh, or maybe they live in a rural area and the, um, the internet is not good enough to be accessing schooling online. However, at the same time, the pandemic did show us, though, that there are really good possibilities for online learning, and it actually does remove barriers in other ways for students with disabilities. So perhaps they can't come to campus, but being able to access it virtually makes that space more inclusive for them. Student advocacy was another thing that kind of popped out in the literature review, and so creating a sense of purpose and, and opportunities for the relationship building among diverse stakeholders was really a thing that, that emerged. Uh, universal design for learning creates more inclusive and accessible learning spaces, um, but there are challenges around implementing universal design for learning, particularly the siloed nature of academic institutions, which can create barriers to implementation. And so sometimes different departments will have ideas about who's responsible for uh, universal design for learning and that can create barriers. To create that more inclusive space, it, you really do need to create an inclusive culture where disability is welcomed. That's a really important part of, of creating inclusive spaces. 
streamline processes would help students in qualifying for support. So sometimes those processes are complex and different departments don't talk to each other, so it makes it really complicated. So if those processes be streamlined, it would certainly make things easier for students. Training is needed for faculty and staff about disabilities in general and also the accommodations and what that means. And then more collaboration is needed between faculty, staff, and students so that there's a better understanding amongst everybody in post-secondary education settings about what it means to create an inclusive and accessible uh, learning environment. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, we'll now move on to meaningful employment, and we'll be looking at the challenges and possibilities for decent employment. Okay, in general, many graduates feel, uh, when we look at the areas of for improvement, uh, many graduates with disabilities feel that they do not receive adequate supports while attending post-secondary education uh, to prepare them for uh, work upon graduation and anticipate that they will not be competitive in the job market right off the bat. Um, oops. Uh, limited accommodations. So most people with disabilities believe that relatively simple accommodations could go a long way in making the workplace more accessible yet many do not receive them. And there are many issues with this, of course. Uh, one of the findings was that uh, employers, employees rather, had fewer opportunities for advancement in their roles and had less professional training. Issues of disclosure was a big one in the, in the literature. So many people, uh, graduates who move into the workspace um, with disabilities do not feel comfortable asking for accommodations from their employers. Uh, given the infrastructural or attitudinal barriers, uh, this unfortunately comes as little surprise, right? So many workers with disabilities anticipate the stigmatization uh, or just, you know, discriminatory, discriminatory attitudes towards them uh, that would come along with even asking for accommodations. And so, in fact, many graduates of, uh, of post-secondary education feel discouraged to look for work because of the anticipation of discrimination that they may experience. So that's a big one. That was, um, you know, they're not even looking for jobs some of the time because of what might occur. Um, job retention and precarious employment is another one. Uh, this is especially problematic for workers with disabilities because they may not have opp opportunities to make stable connections with their peers, natural supports, or their employers which is a great indicator for success in, in, uh, in, in workplaces. Uh, several authors in our literature search argue that these employment disparities for people with disabilities uh, um, it, um, it, uh, occur in job retention, uh, wage discrepancies, hours of work allotted, and access to benefits. And, um, and these include, you know, the, um, this manifest in many ways, but lack of equitable and inclusive recruitment and hiring strategies are common. Ableist assumptions um, of both employers and coworkers, and just a general ignorance towards appropriate accommodations and disability knowledge. Strategies for inclusion. So now we're moving to the right area of the screen. Um, so employment during post-secondary education was a huge indicator for success once students graduated. So one of the primary indicators for students who graduate to obtaining successful employment is working during their time in post-secondary education. Paid employment during school is such a, strong, such a strong predictor of employment outcomes that student disabil students with disabilities uh, that work are twice as likely, more than twice as likely to find paid employment after graduation which increases if they work in the last couple of years of, of their schooling as well. Mm -hmm. There are many reasons for this, but in drawing from the literature, um, developing this, this work, this work experience allows students to develop a positive disability identity. Um, it allows them to explore job options, different job career uh, aspirations, and even um, uh, provides them with the opportunity to build relationships with their employers and their colleagues. Individualistic and holistic practices are also one um, uh, as a strategy for inclusion in the workplace. Um, so this is another indicator for success. 
Career supports and services that people with disabilities receive should be ongoing and sustainable. They should be individualized to the needs of each person, and they should address several aspects in someone's life. So this may include not only career services, but also some things like access to public transportation to work, to and from work, um, help with obtaining assistive, assistive technologies, and help with uh, obtaining mental health supports as well. Collaboration with employers was also a big indicator. So as we saw with post-secondary education, drawing off of uh, um, Tammy, uh, Tammy's section, uh, collaboration is also huge. So several authors pointed out that it is important for employers to be receptive, open-minded, and willing to collaborate with employees with disabilities and have a general overall knowledge of disability. And if possible, um, implement policies which are inclusive, and disability positive, where people with disabilities are not only, you know, um, uh, the space is not only available to them, but they are welcomed and acknowledged for their skills that they bring to the workplace. Okay, well, I'll throw this to Olivia Boonstra, and uh, Olivia will be talking about the transition from school to work. Thank you, Evan, and thank you, Tammy. Uh, so to continue that, uh, I think, as has been noted by both presenters already, systemic issues have been very difficult to deal with and have persisted for decades. So we're looking at things like inaccessible transportation, lack of affordable and accessible housing, food insecurity and discrimination were all noted as systemic issues affecting transition planning and employment access. Uh, there's also a big issue with income caps on support, which can force workers into precarious working conditions, limit employment options and opportunities and give disabled workers very little agency over their lives. The literature also has a focus on the deficit model. So a great deal of the literature in the transition space focused on students and workers with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And this focus is important as uh, people with in intellectual and or developmental disabilities tend to have worse employment outcomes. However, the research is often stigmatizing, um, even in recent publications, and often considers IDD from a deficit or medical model. There's also a lack of adult services and support, a lot of services and accommodations end after high school, and many employers cannot or will not accommodate workers to the same level that they may have received before. There's not any government provided adult services in a lot of cases, which means that the gap is often filled by private transition programs that lack transparency about their effectiveness and can be very expensive. Uh, there's also some issues with intersectional programming. Many transition programs tend to be predicated on white middle class values and very little research in this area considers the intersecting identities of people with disabilities, which is then reflected in programming. So, for example, many programs focus on students or workers living alone or away from their family, uh, but this is not the norm in a lot of cultures. Finally, uh, there's some issues with resources and funding. Transition support can be quite expensive, and this expense is often taken on by disabled workers. Uh, the programs themselves are expensive and often do not guarantee employment, and employers often can't or won't commit to accommodations or assistive technology if they see it as too expensive. So funds and resources need to be allocated appropriately for transition. So some promising things we found in the literature in improving transition from school to work were things like mentorship programs or mentorship elements of programs that help students navigate transition and the biggest thing they do is they really help with networking, which leads to less time job searching. Uh, as has been mentioned, I think by both presenters already, collaboration is really important, especially among service providers and people with disabilities uh, when transition planning and during the transition to create a more accessible system. Uh, programs that are more collaborative can provide more agency and can reduce some of the structural and bureaucratic burdens that come with the siloed approach to uh, post-secondary education. 
Uh, universal design and programming, just as in learning, is extremely important. Um, many students with and without disabilities struggle with transition from school to work, and programming open to everyone can be more inclusive and accessible and means that students don't have to disclose their disability in order to get support. Uh, similarly, as has been mentioned, holistic wraparound services for students and families navigating transition. So this includes ensuring that workers and students have access to transportation, communication tools, housing, and food. And again, more paid opportunities for work, especially early in life, can really help attain future success in long-term employment. Intersectional service provision is extremely important. Um, and Programming needs to consider the diverse needs and identities of people with disabilities. And it's important that intersectional research continues and that the researchers involved in this research uh, better reflect the, the communities that they're working with. And finally, employers need to be committed to changing policies and practices to ensure that all employees with disabilities have a supportive and accessible environment. Um, so just to wrap up, uh, we do have a, a couple of recommendations as they pertain to changes in, in inclusive research and changes to policy. So we do recommend, just given our literature review, that, um, that there should be more research utilizing social model, human rights models, and from an intersectional perspective that really does illuminate and amplify the voices of and perspectives of students and workers with disabilities. And just to really push that idea of, of lived experience being central. Um, and inclusive case studies that sort of ties into that entire idea of less have it, of less focus on the medical or psychiatric models of disability and far more on a uh, on an equitable approach to disability. Um, and that includes more research addressing neurodiversity and uh, and also drawing on existing literature and community organizations. So less of perhaps an academic approach and more looking into the gray literature and literature really on um, on inclusive of uh, inclusive approaches to work and schooling. Changes to policy: um, we recommend the removal of income caps on uh, benefits and support. Uh, we recommend creating policies that inform inclusive design and in post-secondary education, more accessible and collaborative transitions. Uh, transition services or post-secondary education options. So that idea of collaboration was 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 um, paramount in our review, and change uh, to policies that rely on diagnosis in order to receive supports or benefits in post-secondary education and the workforce and in the workplace. So move, again, moving from that diagnostic model, the medical model, into more of a equitable, inclusive approach. We thank you very much for attending this session. Um, thank, uh, if you would like any more information about the SDG project, it's very it's more, very much ongoing. Um, and we have many other projects as well that are ongoing. So please email at us at, at info at evionce.ca and see our website at evionce.ca. Thank you very much for taking the time uh, and we look forward to your questions. That was great. Thank you so much, the team for Evians for putting that video together. Uh, I have a lot of questions myself. I think it's such a, a really great overview of some of the uh, challenges, and I'm I'm very intrigued by some of the proposed solutions there as well. Um, so we're going to move into uh, our section of this uh, presentation today about mentorship. Um, and but before Mary Kate and I get started, we have a very short video. It's about three minutes that. I would love to share just to kind of get a flavor for the program. Um, it is a combination of mentors and mentees who've participated in the program talking a little bit about their experience. So if we could watch that and then Mary Kate and I will come back on and uh, talk about that a little bit more. Participating in this mentorship program has had many significant impacts on my life. Uh, one thing that really stands out to me was my mentor helped me realize that I need to find an employer that sees my disability as an asset rather than something that needs to be overcome. For me, it's been really nice to just make a really, really solid connection with someone who's kind of gone through the same thing at the same time. There's always the visual impairment as well. It's nice to see someone who really has felt what I have felt 
So getting to know Robin over the past six months has made me a lot more confident in talking to people at work about some of the unique challenges that I face as a person living with vision loss. So I was very fortunate to be uh, partnered up with uh, Mary Kate. Um, and Mary Kate's uh, an exceptionally bright and I think gifted uh, young professional. And I think um, our skill sets were, were well matched. Um, we think very differently, but um, the direction that she wanted to go and, uh, and the things that Mary Kate wants to do um, align very much with my own sort of passions. What's unique about Fighting Blindness Canada's mentorship program from other programs that I've gone to in the past is you're paired with someone with a visual impairment and I think that ultimately just breaks so many barriers down the conversation. You have so many opportunities to just talk freely, deal with different things, and sometimes somebody like myself might see a certain situation differently than someone with vision would. I think seeing Hamid's journey through his eyes really made me reflect on my journey, particularly with uh, the eye disease, and it gave me a greater appreciation for what I had accomplished um, in the last number of years. I think mentorship is important because I don't think there's anything else that can replace that one-to-one -one connection that you have with your mentor or your mentee. There's an expression that's used, uh, an old saying that the master becomes the student as the student becomes the master. and. There is such an exchange of information that takes place in a mentoring program. Often people with disabilities, we tend to be more resilient and adaptable. And thanks to the comments of my mentor, I'm able to see that now. Fighting Blindness Canada Mentorship Program really gives us that unique perspective of others who live through similar situations that we have. I can't think of anybody that would not get something very profound out of this experience. If you approach it with a real open-mindedness and an open-heartedness, then you're going to get way more out of it than the time you put in. It's a spectacular experience. I really, really enjoyed it and could not recommend it enough for anything. To learn more about the Fighting Blindness Canada Mentorship Program, please visit us online at fightingblindness.ca. Um, I was just saying uh, to welcome you, Mary Kate. Thanks for joining me today for this part of the presentation to talk about mentorship. Um, we saw a little peek of you in that video there. Um, I thought we could just maybe start off by giving a very brief introduction of who we are. Um, would you like to go first? Sure, absolutely. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Mary Kate Fraser. Uh, I'm from Toronto. Um, I was, uh, I'm was i from Toronto originally. I went to school at Carleton University. So I lived in Ottawa for four years before returning home. And shortly after returning home, I started working in the hospital sector in the GTA. So I've been working in healthcare now for seven years. And right now I'm a project manager. Um, I work both work mostly focuses in uh, hospital infrastructure projects uh, in Toronto, Mississauga. And the reason um, I got invite, um, I got involved with Fighting Blindness Canada is that at 20 years old, I was diagnosed with a condition called retinitis pigmentosa. So I had worn glasses since about the age of six and um, always remember struggling to see at night. Um, but actually when I was 20 years old, they were able to actually um, pick up the condition on a uh, on a um, on an eye exam, and so for for those um, on the call who aren't aware, retinitis pigmentosa, or called RP for short, is a genetic eye condition. Um, it starts uh, typically diagnosed in adolescence and early childhood, and it starts with its progression, its progressive vision loss that starts from the periphery and works its way inwards. So, if you've ever seen a, an image or a cross section of a, the retina, there's this layer in the retina called the photoreceptors. And there's rods and cones, and retinitis pigmentosa impacts the rods first. So those are responsible for peripheral vision and uh, low light and night vision. And then it slowly moves towards the center and starts affecting cones of the central vision. So that was 10 years ago when I got, got diagnosed. And right now at age 30, I have about 20 degrees of central vision. So I can read, I can see faces, I can make out fine details pretty well, but I struggle to navigate, especially in low light conditions or uh, at nighttime. Um, but but so far have kept most of my central vision. So um, yeah, and Maria, am I handing it over to you for your introduction? All right, yeah, thank you. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning, my name is Morgan and I am the manager of education at uh, FBC. 
Uh, so at its core, FBC raises funds for vision research, but we also run educational programs um, that are specifically designed for people who are living with vision uh, health conditions. Um, and I have the wonderful job of helping provide those resources through webinars, our youth program, uh, online content, and health information. Um, I think it's important for me to note at the beginning, I do not have vision loss, but I do have other disabilities. So I bring my lived experience to all of the work that I've done within the disability community uh, over the past 15 plus years. <laughs> uh, and I have a master's degree in critical disability studies from York University. Um, so Mary Kay, getting into sort of um, your involvement, can you talk a little bit about how you, what you, you did sort of touch on this, how you first got involved with Fighting Blindness Canada, but maybe subsequently the Young Leaders Program specifically? Sure. So um, once I got diagnosed, I started researching into the, the programs and the organizations in Toronto that uh, fund vision research, which is how I got, um, which is how I found out about FBC. And then in 2018, I actually went to the first uh, Vision Quest in Toronto, now called Viewpoint. And at that event, um, so this is an event that FBC holds every year, and it highlights the emergency mer emerging therapies um, in different ophthalmological con conditions with a with a, a highlight in ophthalmological ophthalmological conditions that don't ha yet have any treatments available to them. So I went to this event in 2018 and I met Ann Morrison there. She's the director of philanthropy at FBC and her, her son actually has the same condition that I do. So she convinced me uh, to join the Young Leaders Summit in 2019 in Toronto. And so a year later, I attended that summit and I met about four, I would say 40 other young people aged 15 to 30 who also had vision loss. And my sister also had the same condition that I do. But aside from my sister, this was the first time in my life that I had met anyone else who is who has vision loss young or or um old, an older person with vision loss so um it was just such a refreshing experience to walk into the room and, and not have to don't have to explain myself for one of the first times in my entire life why I might not be able to see things or why I might be walking a bit slower bumping into things so that was a really refreshing experience and then um of course that was the, that was in 2019 and I was all excited to go to the next one but of course the pandemic hit and so for two years uh, there was uh, young leaders uh, events online, formally and informally, and then uh, happy to say that in 2022, this year, recently in October, we had our in-person event uh, in Toronto again. Um, and then, of course, um, Morgan reached out a couple of years ago about this mentorship program stemming from the Young Leaders Program, which I, I happily took. And so, Morgan, um, can you tell me a little bit about what inspired the addition of a mentorship program to the Young Leaders Program? Yeah, absolutely. This is such a, a good question. So when I first started at Fighting Blindness Canada, I was really excited to be involved in the Young Leaders Program. Um, you know, my background is in disability studies, and we heard a lot in the last presentation about sort of a more diagnostic and medical model of disability. So for me, it was a very interesting organization to start at because it was quite different than a lot of the things I'd worked in before, um, being focused more on the um, vision research side of things. Um, but what I've always tried to do here is to make sure that people have the information they need to make the best informed choices about their healthcare, whatever that means for them. Um, and I really loved working with this Young Leaders Program because it was, uh, you know, comprised of a lot of really wonderful young people, just like Mary Kate, who may not have had the experience of um, being with other people their age who have vision uh, loss before. So this program is not really about, you know, having workshops about resumes or interview skills, but by really connecting uh, young people together with professionals in a variety of fields to sort of discuss the joys and challenges of the workforce and life in general. Um, the program is developed um, in participation with young people with disabilities, uh, particularly vision loss. And it's a great program. And we had these great summits as um, Mary Kate mentioned, but I still felt like there was a little bit something missing. You know, we'd meet one or two times a year, but then there'd be these big gaps between the time that we'd met. And then when COVID hit, we had to make a lot of changes to our program and move that online. And that was the perfect opportunity to pilot this mentorship program that could offer our young uh, community members um, the sustained supportive relationship over the course of a year at quite a difficult time. And so for us, we kind of define a mentorship as this deliberate relationship in which both mentor and mentee share experiences, have mutual growth, and aim to further their personal and professional development of the mentee. But what we found is we did it, it also had the same effect on the mentors as well. 
Um, there are a lot of studies that talk about the power of mentorship and its significance. And unfortunately, I can't go into a lot of detail today. But, you know, research has demonstrated, like, you know, I think it was reflected in what Evians was talking about, you know, students that have mentors generally perform better in their programs and after they get out of school. Um, there was one study that talked about graduate students, they're much more likely to be satisfied with their programs, to be involved in professional organizations, and have a stronger sense of professional identity. And I really felt that in addition to these benefits, young people with vision loss would really benefit from being able to speak freely with a mentor who has similar lived experiences with vision impairment and disability. And that was sort of the spark that started this program. Um, so Mary Kate, when you first heard of the mentorship program, when I reached out to you, what were your sort of thoughts? Did you have any particular expectations or goals kind of coming into that program? Yeah, when I first heard about the program, I was really excited. I remember we were coming out of, I think it was mid-2021, so we were coming out of one of the longest lockdowns in Ontario, so I was excited to even just meet another human being for the first time in about eight months, so that was really exciting. Um, but one of my main goals for the program was to just meet and get to know someone who had a lot of experience, years and decades of experience in the workforce. The program with young leaders is amazing and there's a lot of young and energized um, participants there, but there's also something really special about seeing someone who's, you know, got 30 or 40 or, um, years in, in, in their workforce. And when, when I was diagnosed, again, I didn't know anyone else. They just told me, you have this genetic eye condition you're legally blind now and you'll, you may go completely blind by the time you're in your fifties or sixties. And I, if there's a lot of unknowns, there probably will always be a lot of unknowns with this eye condition. And so at that time I was really had the mentality that I had to prepare and organize my life around the fact that I may not be able to work when I'm in my forties or fifties or sixties and attending FBC events, like viewpoint, like young leaders through this mentorship program, my perspective has really changed where I don't really see this, I don't really see my vision loss as a reason that I won't work one day. I mean, it's always good to prepare for the future, but there's not going to come a day where that's just not an option for me anymore. Whereas when I didn't know anyone with the condition, I really didn't know what to expect. So um, just meeting as many people as possible who um, have gone through this and they're having thriving careers um, is, is really, I don't even want to call it inspirational. It's more of like a, a relief, like, a, okay, I I'll, I'll deal, I'll deal with challenges when I get to it, but you know, life's not over. My career is not over because I deal with it. And so just having, even just having someone to talk to who knows what I've been through going, who knows what I'm going through now and who's, who's progressed in their career. And also, um, I think you did a really great job in setting me and Robin up together because we have very similar career paths, but we also have the same uh, eye condition. So just getting to know someone and, and having that, um, you know, person to look up to in, in, in a professional setting was, was huge because I've never experienced that before. And um, so um, we're going to ask you, um, it seems like there's a lot of thought went into the program. Could you maybe walk us through the process about how uh, you developed the program, the mentorship program? Yeah, for sure. Um, I'll try to keep it brief because I'd rather have more time for discussion. But, um, you know, if you are really interested in the nitty gritty of it, if you're thinking about setting up a mentorship program, um, you can definitely reach out to me or um, check our website. Um, but we really wanted to create a program that was meaningful and that would be a really positive experience for both mentor and mentee. Um, did a lot of research about other programs in the youth space and the disability spaces. Um, unfortunately, there's not enough of them. There needs to be more uh, in the space for sure. Um, I worked with a consultant who has developed workplace mentorship, mentorship programs before, so a little bit different, um, but kind of still giving me a lot of ideas. Um, and it became really clear that there were sort of five major steps that the successful programs really had, which was a solid design that takes into account the audience and their specific goals, uh, a recruitment strategy that attracts motivated individuals, a uh, strong and well thought out matching process, uh, regular checkpoints that will help guide that mentoring relationship and being able to me measure the impact. Um, so ultimately we decided on a model in which younger individuals will be mentored by individuals over the age of 30. So um, 15 to 30 for mentees, 30 and up for mentors. And this is a bit of an arbitrary number. It's just sort of how our program worked and that's where we made the split. Um, this year, I think we had 
some that were uh, mentor mentees were both around the same age, like within two couple years of each other. And that was a really interesting experience as well to kind of have a bit more peer to peer mentoring. Um, so the most exciting and daunting part of this program for me was matching mentors and mentees. So both parties fill out applications and I learn more about their goals for the program. And once you have a sense of the pool of participants, I spend a lot of time thinking about how to match people based on their interests, learning styles and goals. Um, and yeah, so we provide uh, all of the participants in the program some resources and a guide and then check in with them frequently throughout the year to offer support and encouragement. Um, I could say a lot more, but I'm going to move on because <laughs> I'm very mindful of our time. Um, so Mary-Kate, can you just um, maybe give us just a little taste of what it was like to meet with your mentor and what sort of topics that you discussed together? Sure. So I think the experience of the meeting the mentor, as I mentioned, was well-timed, just given where we were in the pandemic. I think the fact that so many of us have had the experience of working in virtual environments over the past years, I think really helped facilitate this process, um, especially in our case, living with a genetic uh, condition um, means that a lot of us aren't exactly in the same physical uh, geographical location. So setting up a mentorship program where you meet in person, probably pre-pandemic, I, I imagine would have been a lot more challenging, um, but just given where we were um, with everyone online, I think um, really helped facilitate that process. Um, and so I think what um, Morgan had provided at the beginning is we had um, an opening session with all of our mentors and mentees virtually. Everyone got to, little, got to know each other a bit better to understand how the program would work and the sequence of events and talk a little bit about the conversation guides, I think really helped. And so by the time that um, Robin and I actually met, um, we already knew each other a little bit and we could jump straight into um, the conversation guides that Morgan had provided us. And as I said, we both work in, in project management in the public sector. And so we had a lot of uh, similar and shared history. Um, but what was also amazing between, I, I think, I hope Morgan did this on purpose, is that we also had a lot in common kind of outside work and professionally. We're both very interested in sustainability and green infrastructure. So um, I think a lot of our conversations kind of got sidetracked away from the conversation guides and we ended up just like building this very organic friendship, um, which I don't think could have happened, um, you know, pre-pandemic and I think kind of the stars aligned in, in that kind of way. And so the topics that were covered in our session, um, as I said, Morgan provided some great conversation guides to get uh, started. And so some of them included skill building, challenging situations, storytelling, interview practice, um, as well as self-advocacy was a big one that I have never really participated in anything like that before. Um, and I think that's very unique to uh, a program that's designed for people with disabilities. Um, and so we talked a lot about uh, negotiation and mediation. Um, Robin and I are both also very similar in that we both love formal training. And so uh, we talked a lot about different courses we can take and different courses available in Toronto. And I actually just earlier this month passed my um, project management professional, my PMP exam. So that was one that we talked about, which actually came to fruition very recently. And so we talked a lot about what the future looks like. And I think that's where the biggest difference between mentorship and the Young Leaders Program is, is that the Young Leaders Program, because it's age for ages 15 to 30, a lot of it's about that kind of jumping off point where it's high school, university, your first job, building a resume and getting into the workforce. And what was so nice about this program is that it was really more about what's that next step. And I'm seven years into my career now. So Rob and I were a little bit talking about kind of growing in our career and promotions and, and what is the next level of leadership look like. So it's a little bit more of an advanced conversation than say more of a broad um, career oriented uh, session that might be um, with, with, uh, with a broader age range. And so, and sorry to interrupt Mary Kate, I think just very mindful of time. And okay. You've done a really great job of like describing the impact that this relationship has had on you. 